Messiah, oh Bob. If I help him, he's going to help me. He's going to put gas in my car and he's going to pay my mortgage and give me free health care. Oh, you can scream, shout, whine, cry, snivel, piss, and motherfucking moan. Yes, you can shove your opinion up your ass that we Obama's cock has something to keep it company. Don't forget, my friends, the ever-present, the most likely third possibility, you are wrong and I am right. It's a lovely sunny day here in the People's Republic of Fort Collins, Colorado. Right after yesterday, it rained almost all day long, which is incredibly unusual for Colorado, which is a desert, despite what some people think. And this is stating the obvious, the weapons platform from which I launched the cruise missile of my intellect that homes in on and destroys fucking statist all around the world. Left-wing statist, right-wing statist, broken-wing statist, three-wing statist, mutant wing status, whatever kind of fucking status you are. The nuclear tipped cruise missile of anarcho-capitalism will find you and fucking nuke you until you glow in the dark. And then at night, when you're running around, when you're scurrying, when you're out there going, but who will build the roads? But, but who will build the roads? Then we can see you glowing in the dark and that's when we mow you down with the machine gun. Greetings, my friends. I am the great one himself, founder on Cynical Libertarian Society, CYNLIBSOC.com, on the interwebs. In the control room, on the other side of the glass there, being seen but not heard the way women should be, is the lovely and adorable Randy. You can contact us here at Stating the Obvious, Cynical Libertarian Society. The email address is God, that's dog spelled backwards, God, G-O-D, at CYNLIBSOC.com. And the music for Cynical for Stating the Obvious is You Know I'm Right by David Gilmore. It's off his 1984 album. He is the very, very rich, very, very socialist guitar player for Pink Floyd. And like most rich people, he really believes that poor, be, you know, poor people shouldn't be poor because of the evil corporations, but you notice you don't see any him giving any of his money to the poor people. Of course not, because he's rich. And socialism is for rich people so they can feel good about being rich while shitting all over the poor people who bought his albums. Like me. He's a goddamn great guitar player. And his solo albums are fantastic. All right. <sighs> Took a nice little bike ride this morning. Rode out to Lori State Park, where it's still incredibly muddy from all the rain yesterday. Got me some nice exercise, some fresh air, a little thinking. I went bike riding without the advantage or disadvantage, whichever way you want to look at it, of having any type of music playing device. Remember the old days when people like went walking or running or bicycle riding? Back when I was your age. And <laughs> we had to walk uphill in order to go bike riding. Remember back in the olden days, some of you don't, when people went out and did outdoor exercise activities like hiking, biking, running, walking, without taking music with them, when you just would go for a bike ride down the trail and listen to the sounds of nature. Now, of course, everybody I see on the trail has their fucking earplugs in. And, you know, get me wrong, I've talked a lot. I love running, especially trail running, listening to audiobooks. It's like, oh, it's, it's heaven and heaven added together. Trail running and listening to an audiobook at the same time. I've listened to a lot of audiobooks out running the trails by the uh, Horse Tooth Reservoir. Ah, oh, I just said, uh, God damn it. Uh is not a word. Learn to talk. So I went biking today without the advantage or disadvantage, depending which way you look at it, of having any kind of device feeding sound into my ears. It was really nice. 
Fresh air, sunshine, silence. Well, nature silence. Yeah, I'm a little scattered. I'll get with it in a second. But I gotta get some casting done today. This will be going out tomorrow. What? Ah, I forgot to bring that up. Damn it. Randy, do you know where the... Do I even want to read it? Do you know where the Harlan Ellison book is? Did I bring that here? Okay. You guys hold on. I'll be right back. Okay, I found it. Then I'll probably decide not to read this, but just in case. I think I am going to read it. Harlan Ellison, for those of you who don't know, Harlan Ellison is a writer. And there's a documentary that was made about him that I highly recommend you watch. Harlan Ellison is he's an opinionated individual, which is one of the things I like about him. I would certainly say that at least some of my approach to presenting information stems from Harlan Ellison. He he says what he thinks. It's that simple, and you know he doesn't sugarcoat shit, and he such and so, so forth and so on. Apparently, I need a little more coffee. But it, whoa, but it's okay for me to be a little mellow this morning, because I'm sure in a little bit here I'm going to get revved up, and you guys are going to be going wait. What happened to the guy who was talking all nice and calm? All right, Harlan Ellison. He also wrote, and I think I may have talked about this. He wrote the Star Trek episode, City on the Edge of Forever, which, of course, in the actual shooting, the city that was supposed to be on the Edge of Forever never actually made it into the Star Trek episode. But it, he won an award for writing that, and it's regarded as one of the best Star Trek episodes. Anyhow, there's a book. If you search for... You know, if you go to Amazon or your library or whatever, look for Harlan Ellison, Sitting on the Edge of Forever. It's published by White Wolf. I'm almost sure I talked about this before on Stating the Obvious, where they published the original script, which, while the version that got filmed was pretty damn good, the original script was much better. So Harlan Ellison is... He's a very powerful writer. And he's one of these guys, he's very smart. He's wrong about a lot of things, but he's very smart. He writes a lot of essays and opinion pieces and stuff like that. He hated the Star Wars movie. He hated the original Star Trek movie, which, you know, it deserved to be hated. But he, he's also a very good critic. In fact, in this book I'm reading right now, it's Harlan Ellison Edge... Bleh. Harlan Ellison Edgeworks... And it is Volume 1. Edgeworks is a multi-volume collection of Ellison's writings. And he had a piece in there where he was critiquing some directors and talking about making movies and yada, yada, yada. And he mentioned some movies that he thought really did horror well, which I got some of them from the library. haven't had a chance to watch them yet. He also mentioned a movie called The Bad and the Beautiful, which I am currently watching, has Kirk Douglas when he was young and Lana Turner. So you just don't make women like Lana Turner anymore, unfortunately for us. And I honestly can't remember if he was critiquing The Bad and the Beautiful as a good movie or a bad movie. Or a movie that, that had potential but didn't quite make it. But it doesn't matter. I'm watching it. It's a pretty good movie. And I'll talk about this briefly, because this was on my list of things to talk about before I start attacking the pile on the floor. If I even get to that, because we all know how my podcasting attempts go. 
you know, I'm watching this movie, and old movies in general, it just... It seems like the older movies, even like the B movies, just... Well, I shouldn't say that. That's not true. Not the B movies. The older movies, they just feel like they had so much more depth. Like the lines in this movie, just the things. Like so, in this movie, the the, the producer guy, he's looking at this Lana Turner, who who wouldn't want to look at Lana Turner, and he's looking at Lana Turner, and she's playing the daughter of a famous actor who died and the guy was a womanizer and a drunkard and so she's being a slut and a drunkard to sort of make up for this and blah 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 you know and he says to her when I look at you I can see the talent you just gotta pull it out of your ass you know and she says to him when you're looking at she says to him you're looking at me but you're seeing my father you know I mean just lines like that that are simply deep and meaningful and, and have some significance and to me, it just seems to me, and now the other problem here, of course, is that I'm commenting upon the contrast between old movies and modern movies, but I don't watch that many modern movies because they all fucking suck. So I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me that modern movies today, like I watched the, the first remake of Star Trek. I still haven't seen the remake of The Wrath of Khan. My God. We're going to remake Star Trek. Oh, we're the most intelligent generation ever. We're so creative. Let's remake Star Trek because we can't think of anything new. We have no fucking originality at all. Oh, God, fuck me. Fuck me. Oh. So I watched the original, the original remake, <laughs> the original remake of Star Trek and how they mutilated that. I mean, there wasn't a fucking line in that movie that would be uttered by somebody with an IQ over 25. Anyway, The Bad and the Beautiful with Lana Turner. I'm not even halfway through it yet, but so far, I mean, it's good. It's a good flick so far. All right, let me read to you from Harlan Ellison, Edgeworks, Volume 1. This is a opinion piece that he wrote. He's talking about, oddly enough, he's talking about how all of you people out there are stupid because Ellison pretty, Ellison doesn't have a problem admitting that he's an elitist. And that was me getting distracted. Squirrel, sorry. Here, hold on. God damn it. Randy. Will you slap the computer? All right, there we go. Watch this. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Close. The, there we go. All right, done. Ellison admits he's an elitist. And he's lamenting here about stupid people. You know, kind of like what I do on every episode of the podcast. So here we go. Let me read this to you. He's talking about blah, blah, blah. So, a Isaac Asimov wrote an essay in Newsweek, and so we start off with a quote from Asimov's essay in Newsweek, and his essay is called, what's it called? Does it say what the name of it is? God damn it. As it goes straight to the heart of how dangerous it is, in these times to be ignorant of what's really going on in politics, in the sciences, in culture, and social changes. So this is an essay Isaac Asimov wrote and Ellis talked about, about how dangerous it is to be ignorant of what's really going on in politics, science, culture, and social changes. Now keep in mind how ignorant the average person is of what's going on, of how people refuse to accept that they own their own bodies, of how people refuse to understand how somebody could build the roads other than the government, right? How people just cannot grasp how the corporations and the government are the same thing. 
how people cannot grasp that the police are not there to prevent crime because if there is no crime, then there's no need for the police, there's no need for the courts, and there's no need for the prisons. Right? So the police are there to make sure crime continues so that the cops, the courts, and the prisons all continue to have employment. But we're going to talk about how people just don't get it. And of course, Ellison, the whole, the whole point you'll see as we go through this is that Ellison is talking about how the ignorant masses are ignorant and don't get it. But of course, Ellison is ignorant and doesn't get it because while he is an intellectual powerhouse and a great writer, he's a fucking statist. He's the kind of cocksucker who would say, but if we didn't have the government, who would build the roads? You're just so stupid. You just don't understand. We need the government to build roads. You're just a fucking idiot. And he would say fucking too. That's why I like Ellison because he curses, he yells at people. He's, he is not, he's not at all fucking nice at all. You piss Ellison off, he's not going to be nice to you. Remind you of anybody? Ooh, I should do... All right, never mind. Focus. <laughs> I'll do that in a later episode. I got, oh, God, I got to do that. All right, damn it. I have shit I have to do. And and the 10-year anniversary of stating the obvious is coming up in November. I Fuck. I am so scattered. I went First, I left to go get the book to see, to confirm... Did I write it down? No, I didn't. What the hell? I thought I wrote it down. I'm talking to myself. I do that all the time. I'm an idiot. Where is it? Alright. Well, anyway. Sometime in November, our 10-year anniversary is coming up. 10 fucking years that I will have been doing this podcast. Thank you very much. And I'll just be like, Ooh, I think I'm going to start a podcast. Shut up. Like Matt Forney. You know, Matt Forney, I've talked about him before. He writes some good stuff. He's a good writer. Some of his stuff I agree with. Some of his stuff is just, uh, he just shows that he's an idiot. He is a statist. And he started doing a podcast. I listened to a few early episodes, and they were just fucking terrible. Because, like, hi, I'm Matt Forney, and I'm going to read all the search terms that people typed into Google to come to my website. I'm like, dude, that's funny for, like, three minutes. But when you're doing, and it just goes on and on, and it's like, dude, seriously? I haven't listened to his podcast lately, so maybe it's getting better. And at some point, I'll try listening to it again to see if it's gotten better. It's just, I love when all these people are trying to jump on the podcasting bandwagon. I don't know, man. It's like, I've been doing this for 10 fucking years. You know, I feel like, again, when I was your age, we, oh, you little whippersnappers. Oh, you want to start a podcast, do you? Come here and I'll fucking smack the shit out of you. Hey, hey ha, I'm going to start a Manosphere podcast. Oh, shut up. I've been doing this shit for 10 years. Shut the fuck up. You little fucking kids are still running around your diapers. I'm a podcaster. Whatever. I saw, I haven't listened to it yet. I saw... Maddox and somebody else whom I don't know, because like I said I haven't listened to it, I, I don't know anything, started a podcast. It's Maddox. I think it's probably got to be good. So I've got, I've downloaded those, I've RSSed to that podcast. It, what is it? It's all the problems in the universe.com or the greatest problems in the universe.com, something like that. Google problems in the universe, Maddox, you'll probably find it. It's also linked to from his website, of course, the best page in the universe.com. Go there. He's got it currently linked up at the top. So anyhow, but I'm just saying, man, all you motherfuckers who are like, ooh, I'm going to start podcasting. I mean, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the podverse, buddy. Now, Fucking respect your elders, because when I was your age, I didn't talk back to my elders, and I always did what I was told. And I never stayed out late at night, and I didn't drink or smoke either. And if you believe that, I've got a bridge that I want to sell you. All right. Hey, Randy, I have an idea. What if I fucking get around to reading out of the goddamn book here and move forward with the podcast? How's that sound to you? Beauty. And I'm almost out of coffee, so I'm finally starting to get charged up because I'm sucking down enough coffee. You would think the exercise of riding my bike 25 fucking miles, part of it uphill, 
would juice me up. <laughs> I'll tell you what juices me up is the CSU women's volleyball team. All right, anyway, enough about that. Yes, all right, I was about to digress, but I can, I can digress after I fucking do this. Here is the quote from Asimov's essay, and then we'll go into Harlan Ellison's response, and I'm sure at some point I'm going to editorialize along the way. Quote, there is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there has always and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Unquote. Okay, before I start reading what Ellison said, let me allow to point out to you, Mr. Asimov, and your I'm anti-intellectual blah blah blah, that's exactly what democracy means. Democracy, the way it's interpreted, means every person gets one vote, and all those votes count the same. So yes, the opinion of the stupid person is worth exactly the same the opinion of the intelligent person. That is exactly what democracy is. This is why I've been saying for years that democracy is a failure. Not only does democracy mean that the opinion of the most ignorant person has the same weight as the opinion of the most knowledgeable person, But because the number of people who are ignorant on any kind of issue will always be smaller than the number of people who possess an in-depth understanding of an issue. And let me, let me clarify terms for the stupid people out there. When I say ignorant, I mean ignorant, not stupid, ignorant as in not having knowledge of. For example, as I, the example I always use, I am ignorant of brain surgery. I cannot perform brain surgery on another human. I am ignorant of brain surgery. The number of people who are ignorant of brain surgery is always going to be far greater than the number of people who have an in-depth understanding of brain surgery. Okay, The number of people ignorant of foreign policy will always be less than people with an in-depth understanding of foreign policy. The number of people who are ignorant of the banking system will always outnumber the people who understand it. Right? The people who are ignorant of how health insurance works will always be greater than the number of people who understand it. That's how we get Obamacare. Right? The number of people who are ignorant of any fucking issue at all, you pull anything out of your ass, anything, the number of people who are ignorant about that issue, peace in the Middle East, uh, petroleum companies and how they refine raw oil into gasoline, uh, GMOs, abortion, whatever the fuck it is, the number of people ignorant of an issue will always be greater than the number of people with an in-depth understanding. And because democracy is a system where whatever the majority wants, everybody gets, that means that everybody will always get that which is desired by the most ignorant portion of the population. That's what democracy is. Democracy, as I've said before, is a system where the least competent, least capable, least intelligent people run the government. And I say run the government in a very, very metaphorical way. I mean, even they don't run the government, and the government does, you know, Obama does what he wants, Congress does what they want, the DEA does what they want, the FBI does what they want. But the point is, because our government, in theory, of course, because it's a democracy, 
is held accountable to the public. The public means the voting masses. The voting masses means whichever faction gets the most votes, and since the most votes are going to come from the least intelligent people, the only accountability this, the government has is to the least intelligent, least knowledgeable segment of the population. This is why democracy does not work. Ste was it Stefan Molyneux? Stefan, I think it was Stefan, I watched a video of his lately, where he pointed out some interesting stuff about voting and how in the United States it was, of course, when, you know, there are these two big jumps, he says there are two big jumps in the welfare spending of the government. One was when we gave the votes to everybody, so suddenly now poor people could vote, and of course they vote for welfare. And then we gave the vote to women, which of course women always vote to give themselves and other people money, and so there's another huge leap. And Stefan pointed out a interesting thing that I hadn't thought of before. When voting is confined only to men who own property, you're going to have less welfare and you're going to have fewer wars. And this makes sense because if only men who own property are allowed to vote and these men vote for a war, well, the war has to be financed. And the government, in order to finance the war, has to get money. Well, where is the government going to get money to finance the war? Well, from taxes. And who's it going to have to tax? I mean, you can tax the poor people. We do tax the poor people. We, there's no fucking mouse in my pocket. The government of the United States does tax the poor people. As I've said, that's where the money is. The poor people, that's why you tax the poor people. But put this in the context of 1800, right? or 1780, whatever, back in, back in the day when everybody walked uphill. So you've got a bunch of rich white guys who own land and they want to start a war. So to pay for the war, they have to raise taxes. Well, who the fuck are they going to raise taxes on? The poor people who really don't have any kind of money? Well, no, they, they got to raise the taxes on themselves. And since they are the ones who have to pay for the war, pay for the welfare, so forth and so on, they're going to vote against it because they recognize, hey, we can do all this shit via the government, but we are going to pay for this. Now, of course, the disadvantage of, and Stefan didn't point out the disadvantage of, because again, as I've said before, there should be no voting at all. All voting is violence, and no matter who votes, now I can come up with all kinds of elaborate schemes for how we could reform voting by limiting who's allowed to vote. And if we're going to keep voting, I think we should do that, but ultimately there should be no voting, period. Nobody should vote because there should be no state. Or at least you should be able to... See, and the thing is, if everybody could vote, but you could just say, you know what, I'm leaving the United States of America, I'm, I'm no longer a citizen, I'm not going to vote anymore, but I'm also not going to pay taxes, that'd be great, but of course we can't do that. Well, you can, but it's just really difficult, and at some point the government will show up to kill you. Anyway, it was like, oh, so the disadvantage of voting, even when it's confined to white men who own property, is, of course, then you get things like the Whiskey Rebellion, where the white men who own property who are voting will, of course, pass laws to protect themselves, like Washington, you know, with the, hey, I make whiskey, and there's these other people who make whiskey, I'm going to make some laws so that I can keep making whiskey, but they can't make whiskey anymore. And that's exactly what you would get. This is sort of the manifestation of what, when you say to statists, you say there can't be, a, you sh there shouldn't be a government. They'll say, but the corporations would take over the world, right? They don't understand that without the government there would be no corporations. But that's sort of the manifestation. If you only have the rich white men voting, you're not going to have wars and you're not going to have welfare. But what you are going to have is the rich white men using the power of the government to create monopolies and to crush anybody who threatens their wealth, right? Because their number one concern is going to be protecting their wealth, as anybody's concern. Anybody out there, I mean, if you have $100 and you're walking down the street, you know, you're, you're going to want to protect your wealth. You're going to stick your hand in your pocket every once in a while and make sure the $100 bill is still in there. If it falls out of your pocket and starts blowing away, you're going to chase it, right? If somebody breaks into your house and starts stealing stuff, you're going to try to stop them unless you're a 
liberal Democrat and you don't own a gun because you're a fucking coward, then you're going to get out your Obama phone and dial 911 if you can remember the number for 911. But the point is, so that's a natural inclination for any human to protect what they have. To pro We protect our wealth. So if the government is determined only by rich white men voting, you're going to have fewer wars, fewer welfare, but you're going to have a lot more protectionist laws because those rich white men are going to want to make goddamn sure they don't stop being rich. They can't stop being white. They really can't stop being men unless they get castrated, but they're going to make damn sure they don't stop being rich and they'll use the power of the government to make sure they stay rich, kind of like the corporations use the power of the government to make sure they stay in power, right? This is why we have the automobile bailout. This is why we have the banking industry bailout. Those banks and the automobile, all of that shit should have been allowed to fail. Again, you know, everybody points at Enron. I've talked about this before. Enron, look, failure of capitalism. No, no, no. No, Enron was the only successful application of capitalism in recent memory. Enron fucked up. Enron went out of business. That's what should have happened to Bank of America and all the other banks. That's what should have happened to the automobile corporations. All of those motherfuckers should have been allowed to die. Just fucking get wiped out. Declare bankruptcy. Go under. Sell their assets. Give money to their employees. Their employees go out and find a fucking real job for a company that knows how to balance the fucking budget. Or go out and start their own businesses. Or just get on welfare or flip burgers. Whatever. But the point is, all of those corporations were protected by the government. All right, how about I go back to reading the book now? So that's why democracy doesn't work. All right, now this is what Harlan Ellison is writing. It's that old saw that everyone is entitled to his slash her opinion. After saying Harlan Ellison isn't politically correct, he puts a his slash her opinion. Oh my god, that is so fucking PC. It makes me want to fucking puke. Okay, back to reading. In my own wonderful elitist fashion, I've never accepted that for a moment. What I will accept is that everyone is entitled to his slash her informed opinion. Chance favors the prepared mind. Knowledge, education, use of reason, constructive cynicism. That would be me. Those are what keep us from becoming like the man I saw in the news the other night, the item I mentioned earlier. Now at this point, Harlan Ellison is going to tell a story in which he attempts to illustrate how all those fucking white people are so racist. What he's really going to illustrate is that while racism may be a component of this, Harlan Ellison is going to illustrate that he believes that your body is the property of the government. Harlan Ellison is going to illustrate that he believes in slavery. Here we go. We're having horrendous busing problems here in Los Angeles. All those hypocritical lip service liberals who condemn the Deep South for its racism, for keeping the blacks down, for not integrating, are showing themselves to be a solid part of the racist tradition of this country. Let me jump in here for a minute just to remind all of you again, yes, liberal Democrats, the Democrat Party is the party that wanted to keep slavery. Why black people vote for Democrats? is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. I've talked about this ad nauseum in the past. As I've said before, you would think if anybody in this country could recognize slavery when they see it, it would be black people. And yet black people just willingly line up for the welfare. They line up to be told what to do by the Democrats. They fall for every fucking racist trick out there. They you know, they make the babies and then the single mothers raising the baby in the ghetto with the pimp and blah, 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 blah. You know, on and on and on and on and on and on. And I'm not saying this as an insult. To them. I'm saying this because I don't understand. If anybody in this country should be able to recognize slavery when they see it, you would think it would be black people as much as they whine about slavery. And yet they are on the liberal Democrat plantation. 
They absolutely refuse to think for themselves. Not Again, not saying they should go vote Republican because the Republicans are better. No, no, no. No, not saying that. I'm saying if anybody in this country should be anarcho-capitalist, it should be black people. And yet they are the most statist. You know, if I, I, if I help him, he's going to help me. Obama's going to put gas in my car. Obama's going to pay my mortgage. Well, my mass is going to give me a place to live, and my mass is going to feed me every day. All I has to do is go pick the cotton. I mean, how can you people be this blind to the fact that the government, not just the Democrats, not the, the government, is just using you? You, 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 you people form, you people, black people form the majority of the prison population where the corporations get people to work for a dollar an hour to do telephone support. Black people are a large portion of the military where you go to foreign countries and you kill people and you get shot so that the corporations can make money. How can you, how can you, I keep wanting to say you people, but it, it sounds insulting. I don't mean it in an insulting way. I'm talking to a specific demographic. Young black men, specifically, how can you young black men not see how the government is shitting all over you? And you've got Hussein Obama in there. He's the fucking president and you're still getting shit on by the government. How can you not see this? Why do you want to be slaves? Embrace. You, you have the ability to be free human beings. I don't doubt that for a minute. But you don't want to be free human beings. And that's what baffles me. Because you're always whining it. The white man kept us down and shit. And oh, but, well, I'd start a business, but I got to get permission from the white man. I got to get a business license. Well, I, I, anyway, I, I could go on. I could go on for days about that. I have in the past. Holy shit. Randy's pointing out how far we are into the podcast. <laughs> I should... What the... All right. Let me get back to reading. Showing themselves to be a solid part of the racist tradition in this country. As long as Depot niggas was over there in Watts and South Central LA getting shitty educations, if any at all, Everyone out here could be as bold in their speech as they cared to be. But the minute Judge Paul Eagley said all of them Lily White urchins had to share schools with darkies, they suddenly went crazy. And on TV the other night, at a meeting held in one of the San Fernando Valley all white school, all the fuck. Remember, boys and girls, don't try this at home. I'm a professional podcaster. I've been doing this for 10 years. Oh. Yes, professional. All right. And on TV. <laughs> this is, oh. Yes, exactly. Sorry, folks. We're having fun here in the recording studio. And by having fun, I mean Randy is giving me shit for my inability to articulate words. All right, take seven. And on TV the other night, at a meeting held in one of the San Fernando Valley all-white schools, where a lottery was being held to determine which half of the students would be bust, somebody's father got up, screaming, ran to the podium, and threw the baskets of name, name slips all over the floor. He was roundly cheered by the rest of the audience, except for the few rational parents who realized in, the, in a way that commends their nobility to our attention that the discomforts and problems of busing are one of the prices we as a nation must bravely pay for hundreds of years of enslavement of a large segment of our people. That man is a racist. He doesn't know it. Okay. We must bravely pay for the hundreds of years that we as a nation 
enslaved a large segment of our people. Okay, first of all, we, Mr. Ellison, Mr. Intellectual, Mr. Elitist, Mr. You're So Fucking Smart, we have not enslaved any black people. The enslavement was done by a small group of the population and it was empowered by the state. Again, without a state to assist in financing bringing the slaves over here, without a state to enforce the return of runaway slaves, without a state to protect slave masters from being killed by their slaves, there can be no slavery. And in, well, in, our, in an ANCAP society, in your libertarian paradise, why there'd be gangs and they'd take over and they'd enslave everybody. They'd enslave everybody, really. So there'd be like 12 guys and they would enslave the entire population of the state of Texas. Because, oh yeah, because the Jews were dumb enough to get on the boxcars and go to the concentration camps and only, even though there were only like 10 guards there with machine guns. Because of course the Jews had all their guns taken away and they were fucking scared. But you know, but no, no. Hey, Jews, you outnumbered the Nazis. All you had to do was rush them. A couple of you would have died, but the rest of you would have had freedom. But no, 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 it was easier to be a fucking coward, wasn't it? It was easier to get on the boxcar. It was easier to obey the state because obedience was your number one priority. In an ANCAP society, people who are that obedient would quickly be eliminated because there's this thing called evolution and natural selection where the inferior die and the superior survive. In an ANCAP society, if you showed up with your gang and said, we're going to enslave all of you, someone would just shoot you because you'd roll into town and there'd be 12 of you and there'd be 4,000 people in the town and 3,937 of them would all have guns and you'd get shot and you'd die. There would be no fucking enslavement. You cannot have slavery without a state. You can't do it. I challenge you, I fucking challenge you to start a slave plantation and get some slaves and have them being your little slaves on your plantation without a government there to provide police services, to help you keep the slaves in check without federal without government subsidies to pay for all of this you know without laws that say if your slaves run away other people have to bring them back to you or the government will put those people in prison for not you know it's like in Nazi Germany it's against the law to hide some Jews in your attic well you know you couldn't have put the Jews in the concentration camp without the help of the state and you couldn't have put the Jews in the concentration camp without the help of all the people who are willing to obey the state and the few people who said, fuck the government, I'm going to hide the Jews and you can suck my cock, they were the ANCAPs. They were the only ones who were, they were the ones who were willing to say, fuck the state. I'm going to do what's right. But there were damn few of them because most people, here we come back to democracy, why democracy fails, most people just want to be obedient goes back to what I talked about before, the marijuana book, where the guy says, I just want to grow my marijuana and pay my taxes. That, that's, how you, that's how you fucking statists out there are. You want to be a slave. You want to be obedient. You want to pay your taxes. Okay, how is this relevant? I'm not really sure. I'm going on a fucking tangent. Let me get back to what I need to be talking about here. We did not enslave anybody. The state has enslaved. I have not enslaved not a motherfucker. Probably nobody at this meeting, pretty sure nobody at this meeting in fucking white bread, where is this San Fernando Valley? Pretty sure nobody there ever owned a slave. But here's the thing. He said, this man is racist. Are you sure it's racist? Is it all racist? Here's the thing. These people are in here being told that some of their children are going to be put on buses and shipped to some other school. How is it that, and I know the answer, the answer is because Harlan Ellison doesn't believe that people own their own bodies. Maybe part of this is the fact that this man has a child and the government, first of all, is telling him he has to send the child to school, but now the government's going to tell him which school he has to send the kid to. Maybe he doesn't want his kid to go to this school, not because of the darkies, as Ellison puts it. Maybe it's because he doesn't believe his child is the property of the government. Again, why does the government 
get to force you to send your child to a school? Why does the government get to force you to send your child not just to a school, but to a specific school? And what about the environment? Putting all these people on these buses and driving them around. How much additional fossil fuels does that burn? What about global warming? Oh, that's right, global warming. Not as important as taking children and sending them to different schools so as to emphasize to the parents and to the children the government owns your body. And your body will go to whichever school the government tells you to go school, go to. I can't talk. Because your body is not your property. You don't get to decide what school you're going to go to. The government will make that choice for you. And hey, if we have to put a bunch of people on a bus and drive that bus 20 miles to go to a different school, you know, fuck the environment. The environment doesn't matter. What matters is you don't own your body. That's what matters. So gee, could this white liberal Democrat from California possibly have some racism in him? Yeah, yeah, probably so. But some of it might have been his rejection of the notion that the government should be telling his children which school to go to and that he should have to mindlessly obey. And of course, Ellison, as an elitist, likes a population that is obedient. Ellison, as a liberal democrat himself, likes a population that is unarmed and obedient and sends their children to the places they are told to send their children to by the state. It's next on my agenda. I have a list here. Talked about the 10 year anniversary. Yep. Talked about Harlan Ellison. Done with that. But just because I'm ragging on Ellison, seriously, I really recommend reading pretty much any of his stuff. His One of his classic short stories is called For I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Highly recommend reading it. And really, I mean, you, you almost can't go wrong with an Ellison story. His fiction is pretty amazing and impressive, and you can learn a lot about writing from reading his stories and also reading his commentaries about writing. And his op-ed pieces are usually pretty fucking fascinating. Holy shit. Thank you. <laughs> hey, look, there's three minutes left in the podcast, and I'm almost ready to start talking about something. It's okay. I guess I'm not going to go into anything too long here. I do, I'll do. i throw this one out here in People's Republic of Fort Collins. It is, today's July, right, Randy? Is this July? Thank you. July 31st. And end of July is when most of the leases run out. I talk about this every year at this time. And so right now there's this mad shuffle going on as everybody changes apartments and changes rental houses and everything. And out by the dumpsters, there's piles of furniture and clothing that people are jettisoning. And jettisoning. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. There's tons of furniture that people are jettisoning out right by the dumpster at my place. There's like, there's kitchen table and chairs and a bookshelf and all kinds of shit. So if you're in the People's Republic of Fort Collins, man, right now, all you gotta do is drive around out in front of the apartment. Last I looked out there, there's a fucking dresser drawer and a futon sitting out there. There is free furniture to be found all over this town right now. If you had a truck, you drive around, pick it all up. You could take it home, clean it up, and make a fortune probably reselling this stuff if you had like a second-hand furniture store. Oh my God, it's just free-for-all. Anyway, every year at this time, I come on the podcast and I talk about how this is the time of year where I hope, and allow me to take a moment to point out to you that hoping is not a process. Right? I talked about this extensively when the Messiah was running for election 
originally the first time around. Woo, low flying aircraft. You know, we can't wow, change and hope. And it's like, no, hope is not a process. You're going to vote for this guy because of hope. Like, what the fuck does that mean? If I say to you, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing the podcast. I'm going to hope that somebody brings me a pizza. Right? That's not a process. I can sit here and hope that somebody brings me a pizza all I want. Odds are very insignificant that I'm going to get a pizza. Right? So hoping is not a process. If you want a pizza, you create value for other people so that they give you money then you have the money, you contact a pizza place via internet, text message, telephone, whatever. You order a specific pizza, you give them your address, they bring the pizza to you, you give them the money, you take the pizza. See, that's a process. Hoping that somebody brings you a pizza is not a process. And if you attempt to achieve anything in your life by hoping, then you have already failed. This is why voting for Obama was a vote for failure before he was even elected. Anybody with a brain knew this. This is a man whose entire campaign platform was change, which is meaningless, right? Because if we're, you and I are standing here and I take a baseball bat and I hit you in the head and collapse your skull and kill you, that's change. You were alive, now you're dead. That's change. Okay, Change is not a positive thing. Change is value neutral, and change can be very, very bad. And then, of course, the other is, uh, was hope. So this guy who ran on hope and change, two completely meaningless concepts that achieve absolutely nothing. Neither of those is a process. Having said that, and having explained why you should never hope, this is the time of year the people who live on each side of my apartment in my complex have moved out, as has at least one other that I know of. So we got at least three units turning over right there in my proximity. This is the time of year where I hope, which is a completely useless concept, again, let me emphasize, hope does not work, where I hope that the people who move into those units, number one, do not have dogs, Number two, don't smoke a lot of dope, now that it's legal. Number three, I hope they're cute girls. Need some fucking cute girls. Can I get some fucking cute girls in the fucking apartment complex, please? Fuck. That's all I'm asking for. That's all I'm hoping for, Messiah. Oh, please, Obama, will you pass a law that some cute girls have to move into my apartment complex? Please, Messiah, I'll vote for you.